Do you believe this is the fifth take of this service? It's been that kind of a day. And so, welcome to our worship on Father's Day, June the 21st. And a special congratulations to all the fathers in our congregation. And may God bless you for the love and care that you showed to your family. And may he guide you to do the same from this day forward. Today we offer our sympathy to Kenny Bruggemeyer, who's lost his friend Kenny Gaylor, and we pray for the family and friends of the departed. In the weeks to come, we have a vacation Bible school going online. I'm not sure what that means, but parents, if you would like to have your children involved, it's the first week in July, so please contact the church for registration. I believe this week we're also going to sit down and discuss the survey that you took in the last week about returning to church. Pray that God will grant us the wisdom to deal wisely with these decisions, and thank you very much for the time and the effort you put into replying. With those thoughts in mind, we can continue with our service. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with the readings. The first reading today is from Jeremiah, and it tells us that Jeremiah accuses God of forcing him into a ministry that brings him only contempt and persecution. Yet Jeremiah is confident that God will be a strong protector against his enemies and commits his life into God's hands. We begin now with Jeremiah 20. O oh Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed, and you have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For wherever I speak, I must cry out, and I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more of his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire that shoots up my bones. I'm weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whisperings. Terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All of my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can even be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But Lord is with me, and he's like a dread warrior. Therefore my prosecutors and the people who are trying to get me will stumble, 
and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never, ever be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous, and you see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of all evildoers. We continue with Psalm 69. Surely for your sake I have suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, an alien to my mother's children. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humble myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. I put on sackcloth also and became a byword among them. Those who sit at the gate murmur against me, and the drunkards make songs of me. But as for me, this is my prayer to you at the time you have set, O Lord. In your great mercy, O God, answer me with your unfailing help. Save me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Let me be rescued from those who hate me and out of these deep waters. Let not the torrent of waters wash over me, neither let the deep swallow me up. Do not put the pit to shut its mouth upon me. Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind. In your great compassion, please turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer me, for I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me. Because of my enemies, deliver me. Our second reading comes from Paul's letter to the people in Rome. Romans 6, beginning with the first verse. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel comes from the book of Matthew, beginning at the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And as we think about the gospel, let us remember that Jesus warns his disciples that their ministry in his name will meet with opposition. However, he assures them that they need not fear, for truth will come to light. Life is found in Christ. Now Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above its master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave to be like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul 
and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more valuable than any sparrow. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against father, and a daughter against mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their lives will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you, O oh Christ. Wow. So this is the week when the lessons seem to put God on trial. That's pretty obvious in Jeremiah's lesson. Of course, Jeremiah was known as the, the weeping prophet. He was the one that hid in the cave when Nebuchadnezzar's army ravaged Jerusalem and took everyone away as slaves. And as he sat in the cave, he cried and he wrote some of his text. With Jeremiah, he's unhappy with God. He's angry with God. You gave me this job. You conned me into taking it. You pushed me out into the public. And look at the mess I'm in. They're yelling at me. They tried to kill me. Where were you? Did you know this was going to happen when you gave me this job? I'm just a kid. And God responds to him saying, you're still alive. I was with you. I gave you what you needed to know and what you had to say. And you did the job. Now go back and do it again. Oh boy, aren't you glad you're not Jeremiah? Aren't you glad those things don't happen today? Well, actually they do. All too often, God calls us to be his witness. And somehow, we decide how that's going to work. And we get it wrong. <laughs> you're surprised? I don't think so. Most of you probably know the old, old story about the fellow sitting on his porch during the flood. And as the water is lapping at the floor of the porch, the fellow in a jeep drives through the water and says, Get in, I'll take you to safety. And the man responds as a good witness to God, The Lord will protect me! Well, the next thing you see is the guy sitting in the second floor of his house with water lapping up against the windows that he's looking out. And a boat comes by, and they say, Come into the boat. We'll get you to safety. The Lord will provide for me. Don't worry about me. And as the story goes on, of course, there he is on the roof, holding on to the chimney with his feet in the water. And a helicopter comes overhead, and a rope dangles down and says, Grab the rope. We'll get you to safety. Don't worry about me. God will provide. The waters will subside, I know it. Well, about a half hour later, there we see him, swept away in the flood, bobbing like a cork until he doesn't anymore. And suddenly, a very soggy and angry man stands before God and says, I proclaimed you to my last breath. Where were you? And of course, God responds, I sent you a car and a boat and a helicopter. Why didn't you listen? We're very much like that all too often. Only a couple of months ago, in fact, I think it was less than that, maybe it was a couple of weeks, I think in South Carolina, a church gathered together and said, 
We are people of the Lord, and he will provide and protect us. And so they gathered in their church, and they worshiped, and they sang, and they shared the peace, and they shared communion. And within a month, 23 of them had come down with the virus. And the saddest part of the story is the pastor standing there shaking his head saying, I guess maybe we should have taken more precautions. You think? Of course. We trusted in the Lord. Where was he? Well, he was the one motivating all the people on the televisions, every one of them from some reputable health organization or county health company, saying, wear masks. Safely distance yourself from others. If you're going to go into a church, obey these things. And stones to make a lot of breathing and noise and sounds that will propel the, the moisture to others but will be trapped by the masks. Probably wasn't what they wanted to hear. And so they decided, well, our God will provide for us in some different way. The only problem with that thought is we don't get to tell God how to do the job. God gets to tell us. <sighs> I guess you know that. But in so many things in our personal lives, we still say, love you, God, but here's what you really ought to do. And if that was enough, we can stop with our Jeremiah's lesson. But as Jesus says, there's a lot more conflicts in the world than just that. Family against family. In the days of Jesus, that was especially true. Imagine a young man telling his dad, hey, I just been to the temple and I heard about this great guy and I listened to him preach and he is something. His name is Jesus and I want to follow him and dad, will you? Dad gets angry. No, no, no. He's starting a cult. Don't you know nothing? You stay with the God that my grandfather worshipped. You stay with the God that I worshipped. You're a Jew. Stay a Jew, not one of them Jewish Christians. And the conflict between father and son began. Of course, we don't have that today, or, or do we? Imagine if you as a father, especially on Father's Day, went in and shook your son, who just came home from college, awake, and said, Hey, lazy bones, we're going to church. Get up. Your son said, um, um, Dad, I should have told you, but uh, I've been talking with this professor at school, and, uh, well, now I'm an atheist. <laughs> How do you react? You smack him on the head and say, get up, we're talking to the pastor, you idiot. Do you slam the bedroom door and say, don't you say one word about that to your mother, the shock will kill her. Or do you respond in kindness and in mercy and say, maybe we ought to talk about it and maybe we ought to have somebody with some religious background talk to us as well. You see, in every conflict, there's a choice. We can respond in anger. We can respond in kindness and in love. And you've got to make that choice. Jesus talks about conflict in the family, but there's more than that in this world. Ever watch television? See people stomping through the streets, screaming and waving flags? That's conflict. That's major conflict. Did you ever hear the politicians railing back and forth at each other? Sometimes that's funny, but it's also conflict. Do you ever look at your own community and perhaps see conflicts? Do you look in the church and see conflict? In the greater church, the one with all the denominations in it, have you ever had someone tell you that, well, I love you very much, but you're not going to Kevin because my God says you're not worshiping him in the right way? How do you respond to that? Ah, uh, can you get angry at it and say, well, my God's just as good as your God? <laughs> or do you shake your head and say, well, 
thank you for what you have to say, but I'll pray that you understand who my God is too, someday. Living today is not easy. We have conflict in the world. We have conflict in our communities. We have conflict in the greater church, and we can even have conflict in our own congregations. We see that all too often. And wherever there is that conflict, once again, you have this decision to make. Do I respond in anger? Do I respond in love? Funny thing I've noticed, anger usually means listen to me, do what I want to do because I have the right answer and you don't. Listening in love usually has something to say about maybe there's more than one right and more than one wrong. Maybe there's a compromise that we can make. Maybe we shouldn't be asking about what's best for me, but what's best for the congregation. Or I'd rather yet, what's best for the church, for God? What would be pleasing to God? Those are a lot harder decisions to make than trying to figure out how to get what I want this time. <sighs> I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of conflicts in a lot of different churches. And very rarely have I ever heard someone say, but what's right for the congregation? What I've usually seen is there are two groups, each very much invested in their points of view. And sadly, there's about 80% of the rest of the congregation that are simply going, as they look back and forth at the debate, totally not divorced from it, but totally lost as to what to do in it. Whenever there is a conflict, the two groups have to somehow come together and say, what's best for these people? How can we protect or serve them? Paul tells us that we are children of God and that we are dead to sin. And being dead to sin means alive to a God who gives us his love to share. Unless we make our decisions in love, they'll never be pleasing to God. And so I ask you to think about these things and about all the other conflicts that go on around you. The ones in the world that you can watch but probably have no effect upon. And so we pray for the people out there that they'll find wisdom and peace. Conflicts in your family that you can ask God and perhaps your church to guide you in resolving. Any conflicts that might come up in the church? Did you say, Lord, <laughs> I can't make one church on earth, but I pray that you use me to help all the different churches love one another. And in a congregation, ask, may we never have another conflict that will divide us. May we always be united in our love for one another and our love for Christ. This week, homework time, I'd like you to look at your lives and say, where are my conflicts? What should I pray about? What should I do? And when I do them, how do I do them in a way that's both loving and kind and restorative? Let's close with a prayer. Lord, you give us the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. Help us to accept that there are wrong things in the world that we can't resolve, but have to turn over to you. Lord, help us to recognize and have the courage to work on the wrongs that we can make right, 
both in our lives and in the area around us. And Lord, give us the wisdom to be able to discern the difference between those two. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. United as one body of Christ, I ask you to confess with me the faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and, and the, the life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole of creation, let us pray for our shared world. Expansive God, you bring diverse voices together to form your church. Open our hearts and unstop our ears to learn from one another. The differences might not overshadow our baptismal unity. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bless and protect the caregivers and guardians of our world, the emergency workers, nurses, doctors, and therapists. Bless and protect the soldiers, police, and firefighters as well. May your love and compassion comfort and sustain them. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of care, you <clears throat> created us in your image. Help us to see your likeness in one another. Open our eyes to see and attend to all who face sickness and suffering. Console, heal, and nourish all in need. Today we ask that you be with Belinda, with Steve, Nancy, Joan, and Sandy as they struggle with their illnesses. Hear us, O God. We know your mercy is great. Compassionate God, you are with us and we are never alone. Bless all fathers and father figures who strive to love and nurture as you do. Comfort all who long to be fathers, and for all whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Reigning God, you bless us with guides and caretakers in our faith. Today we give thanks for Kenneth Gaylor, and we ask that you increase our care for one another until we walk with them and him in newness of life. Your Hear mercy us. is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we begin our offering prayer today, we give thanks to all those who continue to support this ministry with their gifts and their offerings and the many, many things that they do to help in our journey. Let us pray. Merciful God, our ordinary gifts seem small for such a celebration, but you make of them an abundance, just as you do with our lives. Feed us again at this table for service in your name. In the strength of the risen Christ. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray <clears throat> as Jesus taught us. Our, our Father, Father who art in heaven, in heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against, against us. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Again, Happy Father's Day 
to all the dads out there. And I ask for a special remembrance for my own dad, Sabrunia Levi, David L. Kennedy. I miss you, Dad, and you did a great job. And we ask that each of you give thanks to God for your father on this special day. And now receive this benediction. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. And so be safe, love one another, enjoy all the blessings that God has given to you, and share them with one another. We leave you with this message that Anne has found for you.